Okay. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, we have the fortune to have uh, Dr. Rich Snell here today, and he recently retired from USGS and started his own one person conference. He said open science computing. We're trying to tackle the open science computing on the cloud one group at a time. That's what he said. And <laughs> I met Rich four years ago, maybe, and started to Having on the off uh, conversations on um, cloud computing, open science, and um, different things that different values like ESEP and others. I think you're going to be back in July here, right? Yeah. Right. ESEP is coming to Asheville in July. And so today he's going to give a talk and he'll be in the building from today all the way to Thursday. We have some collaborations going on, setting up some of the open source platforms on um, how people can use NOAA's data on the cloud. As well as on the cloud data format conversions um, overall. And Kuja already started working with him this morning, do some troubleshooting on some of the projects that just and I were working together on that. And so, and if you have any interest in um, talking with Rich, either after this talk or throughout this week, uh, let me know. We can set you up for a meeting with Rich. Without further ado, I'm turning over to Rich um, for his talk. All right. Thanks, Douglas. Uh, yeah, I, I love going around. Yeah, this is what my I, I love USGS, create this little company, and basically, as Doug said, it's just all I really want to do is try to get more groups exposed to this stuff. So it makes me really happy to be here talking about this, and I hope that at least some of you will be. That was cool. I want to do that. Uh, it's all open source uh, stuff we'll be talking about today. Uh, so Pangeo. Uh, community platform for open, reproducible, and scalable GSIs. Hopefully that sounds good. <laughs> um, this is uh, a talk really, you know, by me here standing here, but it's really I'm just like a evangelist, you might say, for the Pangeo community, because it's really been a, a huge community that's put this sort of system together. <laughs> Okay, um, I, I like to show this at the beginning because um, this is this kind of uh, simulation was really what got the Pangeo project started. It was started sort of selfishly by uh, Ryan Abernathy at Physical Ocean Art for Columbia. Um, and he was involved with uh, some folks who were running these kind of global circulations. This models, this is a global ocean circulation model at one kilometer. Actually, this model is now, the animation was on a lower res, but the, the, the version that he was trying to access was a one kilometer version of this run at one for one year, saved at hourly output. And it was the, the size of that one single simulation data set was one petabyte. So the question was, how do I, how do I and how do my colleagues work on a data set of one petabyte? Uh, you know, we're not going to just download it to our laptop, right? <laughs> so, uh, so we need some kind of framework, some tools that will allow us to work with simulations of this size. And so that, that's what actually kicked off the Pangeo project in the beginning. So um, the Pangeo project actually started out with um, this, uh, you know, these guys over here, NSF funded. Um, uh, interesting, I just learned this yesterday listening to a podcast. So Lamont Doherty, uh, Columbia, uh, was where Ryan was. Um, he partnered with a, a postdoc at, U at UCAR, Joe Hammond. Uh, they brought in some folks from the British Met Office. There were a few other players as well. Uh, but it really interestingly, they brought in um, Anaconda, which is a uh, professional open source software development company, help them build these tools. So the idea was actually not that they were going to build something new, but they were going to take all these tools that already existed and were already being widely used in the scientific community and really try to put them together to see if they could solve these kind of big data problems. And initially, it wasn't actually targeting the cloud. They actually had proposed in their budget, just as I said, just learned this yesterday on this podcast that Ryan gave, um, you know, uh, where he was talking about the beginning of the project. He said initially they had a couple hundred K in their budget to buy some servers to run this stuff on. And NSF said, said, NSF said you're gonna have to make some cuts to your budget uh, we like the proposal, but you know, you're going to have to cut. So they cut the servers. And instead, they got um, NSF was at the time uh, had this uh, agreement with some of the cloud providers that they would give them research credits. So instead, they got $200,000 of research credits from Google. 
So that turned them into starting thinking, okay, let's re 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 rethink this. How can we get this uh, stuff to really work on the cloud? And actually, thank goodness they did because it turned into a super cool uh, project. I mean, it, might have been, it was going to be a cool project anyway, I suppose, but um, it really took off um, when they realized what you could do on the cloud. And since then, it's been joined by lots of other groups. Now, okay. <laughs> joined by lots of other groups. Um, Amazon has provided a bunch of credits. Uh, NASA, through their um, some other grant programs, has helped build this out. And lots of other groups have joined in. Um, USGS, and uh, there's you know, a thousand other logos here. Part of the reason that people could join in so easily, I just want to mention this, was because right in the beginning, um, they had this um, mission statement and this little this little statement on their GitHub page. Angie is an open group. Anybody who agrees with our mission and vision is willing is welcome to join. And you could just add your name. It could have a pull request, you know, with your information and become part of the team. <laughs> you know, so that's what I did when I found out about this. I was like, this is fantastic. And I did that. And then and then I would say you guys, and they'd say, no, us. You know, so I felt immediately very welcome in this community. I had been actually trying to do something a little bit similar. And when I realized what these guys were doing, I just dropped what I was doing and joined this community. So uh, it's a community and um, the, I don't know. Yeah, we're actually, should I be pointing somewhere else? Maybe? Yeah, yeah there you go. Okay. It's also um, a platform, and sometimes, I mean, I'm sure everybody here has, has heard of FAIR, the FAIR principles, right? Um, but FAIR is not a platform, right? And nobody will disagree with FAIR, but then they're like, okay, how do you do FAIR? Oh, part of you know, doing FAIR is being like having tooling that everyone can use and creating data sets that people can find and access and reuse and all that, right? So um, Pangeo is something that you can just install and start using it. Uh, but Pangeo is really, um, it's a collection of tools and a community that is working with those tools to make them really safe. So part of it is uh, having cloud-friendly data over here. Um, this means uh, data that's accessible somewhere in like object storage and is in chunks, some kind of chunks or in numerous files, which is, tends to be the case. Lots of files sitting somewhere in object storage. Um, and then we have this, uh, Component that, uh, yeah, well, the resolution. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> I was lost here, but um, we have, oh no, there it goes. So we have this DASC. It's better. Oh, it's washed out. That's what it is. Okay. Anyway, um, we have this package DASC, which um, automatically does parallelization of operations and so it can work on multiple chunks of data in parallel. And that is, it's going to take, just bear with me here a little bit. Um, and then, and then we, uh, that is actually underneath the hood in this package called X-Array, which actually represents the NetCDF data models. Everybody knows what NetCDF is, right? Yeah, all right, cool. Uh, so th this represents the NetCDF data model, so um, in, in a Python package, um, unless you do all sorts of cool things with that model. And then Holoviz is a package that we use for interactive visualization uh, of data in the browser. And in the browser, yes, it's all running in, under Jupyter, it often is we have this whole thing running somewhere on the cloud and the servers, the servers running on the cloud. And that means you just need this little lightweight internet connection to be happily sitting in the park with your Wi-Fi hotspot processing uh, tons of data with a bunch of processors. And just um, I just like to mention too that somebody said, you know, that doesn't really look like a scientist. And I was like, why? Because she's a woman of color? And they're like, no, because she's smiling. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was great. Okay, uh, so uh, let's see. Demo time. Okay, let's. Uh, I, I was originally not going to do a demo, but then I was like, how can I not do a demo? And this it really, you know, it, this becomes so much more real when you can see this stuff in action. And this is something that I hope you could just go, you know, start doing here yourself. Click harder. Click harder. Which is my. Uh, PC so, user, not a Mac user. Yeah, there's still yeah. a few of us, you know, just to. Um, so, uh, I've already actually, I was going to show you the whole thing, but basically I just authenticated with GitHub. So, went to Navarre up in the upper left there, navarre.esafed.org. Um, and uh, I authenticated with GitHub. This is using GitHub to authenticate, so I haven't 
So I've logged in and now I can start a server. So I, I can choose from a regular instance with two CPUs and eight gigs of RAM or four with 16 gigs of RAM, or you know, we could configure this to have like GPUs and other stuff or bigger instance, you know, if you needed more memory to start off with. But generally we don't use a lot of memory just in the notebook. We fire up a cluster to then give us access to a lot more memory and a lot more <laughs> processing power. So this is starting up, um, you know, this is uh, you know, running a container. Um, this is all running on Kubernetes. So every user that shows up, um, you know, there's a request for uh, a Kubernetes pod. And um, let's see, this is, oh, this is because we're just uh, doing some work here. So um, I'm going to, gotta click harder. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm gonna. So I've got a bunch of tabs open here. In fact, I'm gonna open up this little file browser over here. So I've I've navigated out to some area, um, and now I'm gonna show you. Zoom in. Yeah. Make that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and that was the. Is that? Yeah. You got it. Okay. Is that good? Yeah. Is that okay in the back? Okay. Um. Yeah. So I wanna I wanna show off this particular um, notebook that explores a big data set that. Um, that we actually, um, it was a bunch of NetCDF files that had been produced by a simulation model that we run every, that we were running every day at the U.S. And, it, and it's the U.S. East and uh, Gulf Coast. So it's an ocean model with waves. Uh, it's actually a coupled ocean model with the atmosphere, atmosphere and ocean. Uh, and it's run every day, uh, produces two files a day. And then, but this is the, an archive of all of the, um, all of this data from, I think, 2000, or something like that to 2019 or something like that. And we, so a big pile of NetCDF files and um, we, we, we re-chunked them. I'll tell you what, the, you know, what I mean by that in a bit, um, but then we uploaded more NetCDF, we uploaded these NetCDF files into the open data program at AWS. They said, yes, we're interested. So it's being posted by Amazon for free with no ECS fees, so it's public access. And, um, but then, so I'll show you this notebook that we wrote this is the notebook that if you go to the Open Data Set program, you'll see there's like an example notebook. This is that notebook. So you can run this yourself later if you want. So um, basically, you know, we're going to just import some packages, ship, enter to execute a cell in this notebook, and you see the little star there, and then when it turns to a one, you know, that's the first thing that you've executed. So it takes a little bit to um, just import those packages. Uh, but then we're going to go down, and now we're uh, we're actually opening up um, a catalog of data sets using something called intake. And um, if I wanted to actually let's see here, control shift, yes. yeah. So I just uh, created a new uh, cell. And if I wanted to do like list, uh, I could list all the data sets in that catalog by doing that. Um, Good one. <laughs> <laughs> there's one in this particular catalog, but there could be many. Just imagine that there's a lot, you know, uh, a different catalog might have a lot. Um, these these so-called intake catalogs are a convenient way to represent otherwise data sets that otherwise require complicated ways of opening them up, but in a standardized way. So we've got our one data set. So let's uh, take a look at what's in there. You can say, uh, you look at the catalog and it'll tell you if you if you just print out the, uh, the the data set, it'll show you a bunch of arguments that I didn't have to include in my Python code that my users might find a little overwhelming. Or, um, and but it, and it's also pointing to you can see that it's pointing to this parquet file here that's sitting on a bucket in this Amazon public data program. This is actually not the NetCDF files, as you can tell, but this is referencing into these NetCDF files, which we'll also talk about in a bit. So. It's a single data set, though, from the user perspective, because all the user has to do is say that data set to DASC, and they get back an X array data object. Um, so this is the NetCDF data model. It comes back with you know, something scary in pink. But the scary thing in pink is actually a future warning that the return type of data set DIMS will be changed in the future. Please use data set sizes. So it's a friendly message. <laughs> it's a nice message. It's a good message. <laughs> and this is very typical when you're running pipeline code, right? Now it's a little unusual for them to tell you that there's going to be a problem in the future if you don't change your code. So, uh, so let's take a look at this data set. So, um, you know, we have opened the data set. We have not read 
uh, anything from this data set because um, you know the study data set is about 10 terabytes. Uh, and so what all we've loaded is the coordinate data, but we can already see everything we you know we want to know about this. Um, what the, you know that's got uh, 112,000 hourly time steps. Um, you know, ocean time, it's got a bunch of different variables, so on and so forth. We can um, actually, the data variables are down here, so these are all the things that, you know, as a scientist, we might want to look at. Um, you know, lots of things that may be, you know, not very familiar to folks here, uh, but, you know, if we get down to things like salt, <laughs> uh, like salinity, um, uh, like a, um, we can see other information about the NetCDO file, but this is, this is in fact salinity. Um, and if we put this little guy over here, we can see that this particular variable, it, if expanded in memory, would be two terabytes. Okay. Um, but we see this nice little graphic here that shows us that actually this two terabytes are split into chunks of 24 megabytes. This is important. I want to show this because. Um, so this entire data set is all these little chunks of 24 megabytes. So in fact, 85,000 of them, okay, of these chunks make up this, this particular variable of this data set, okay? Um, so now let's say we want to pick one of these variables. Okay, I'm just actually doing the same thing here for the wave height. There's no way to do it. You can say um, the data set, and then you can just reference a particular variable, and you get back some information about it. So here again, we see the wave heights is the same kind of chunking. Um, here we're going to take advantage of some um, climate and forecast conventions that have been written in this file to be able to uniquely identify what latitude, longitude, and time are, and then just, you know, and then so now we, so we don't have to figure out, okay, what was the name of the time variable? Oh, they called it ocean time. So if we use the CF conventions, we can just go ahead and determine what those are, and, and then we can just use latitude, longitude, and time, which is really convenient if you're like comparing a bunch of different models, for instance, right? Like you could act if they all follow the CF conventions, you just do this little operation, and then you can you know compare everything just uh, using standard names. All right, so um, so how do we actually get some data? So here we can just say, because we've done this CF thing, we can say, uh, whoa, whoa. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> um, we can say time equals, you saw the cursor there? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we can say this, this, this data array uh, that, is the, that is the wave height, we want to load a particular time step, okay? So December 29th, 12 o'clock, 2012, and we're going to get the nearest uh, information and we're going to load that data. So we shift enter that cell, and now we're going to see how long it takes to load a single time step of data essentially from one. So it took like four seconds, okay? So that's pretty good. We dipped in there and we got just what we wanted. And, and now let's, you know, let's plot it up. Um, shift enter, we're going to use this HP plot in this one line. Uh, it actually takes longer to make the plot than it does to get the data. But look at this cool plot. I mean, this is not a plot. This is like a, it's like a GUI almost to like explore this data because you can hover. Um, you can turn this little guy off over here and you can like click this and shift. Oh yeah, okay, good. Okay, yeah, you can like click and drag and I don't know if you saw that, but it re, uh, it rescaled like when I, when I, when I did that, so. Um, if you can, you can pan around and say like, okay, so, okay, I, I, this is Hurricane Sandy, by the way. Oh, I should have asked who knows what this is. This is Hurricane Sandy, um, but if you wanted to know like what was going on in Hurricane Sandy, like, you know, down in North Carolina, where you didn't see anything, like, if you saw it rescaled there. So, like, every time you, so this tool is cool because no matter what the resolution of this data is, it rasterizes to the resolution of what you asked for here, so a few hundred pixels by a few hundred pixels, and delivers those pixels to your browser every time you move. So it, re it regenerates just what it needs for those pixels to display in your browser, but it creates a dynamic application that you can use for any kind of resolution. Like we've used this for super high resolution triangular mesh models that you wouldn't be able to look at like really any other way, I don't think. So that's a cool, so that's why the whole of this stuff is super cool. So now we're going to uh, go down and let's try to go down. <laughs> you need an assistant? No, no. 
so now we're going to load. So, so we just made a map. Great. I mean, that's the way we always write our data, right? We take some time steps and we write out some output. So maps are always pretty good. The other way, uh, taking a time series at a point, um, I don't know how many people struggle taking a time series at a point from a very large couple. Anybody? We call this the pancake problem <laughs> because we write our models like pancakes. Then we got to eat all the pancakes to get a time series. Like, you know, it's no good. So uh, I'm going to show you here, though, because we've re chunked this data. Um, we pick a lab on location. We use this cool package called XO, which finds out which point to extract. And then we just go ahead and extract that. Okay, so no cluster. Uh, so we loaded here one month of data. Actually, I should have shown you here. So before I loaded it, actually, it doesn't load when you're using Dask, this the package that I mentioned, it doesn't load anything until you tell it to. So when I executed this cell, it actually didn't load the data. It told me what the data was going to look like after it would be loaded. And so here I can see that it's only five chunks of data because it's only one month that I asked for, okay? So each chunk has 168 time steps, five chunks for a month. Okay, so I'm like, oh, okay, five chunks. I can load five chunks of data without a cluster. And I just did within two seconds, okay? So then I can go ahead and execute this cell. And again, we have this live um, you know, plot that we can zoom if we want to and we can and, you know, interrogate. We can see that you know, at this height that I selected off of, uh, off of New England, um, you know, we have eight meter wave heights on this particular day. But the main thing is just how quickly we can load that data. Now, what if we wanted to load the entire thing, all 112,000? So that's 669 chunks, okay? Um, for that, we probably want a cluster. So we're gonna fire up a cluster. There's a bunch of different ways to do that um, with DAS. Uh, if you're using one of these instances like this, we can do what's called a gateway cluster, but um, there's like a local cluster that will just use the CPUs on your system. Like in this notebook, we only have two, so that wouldn't be too good. Um, we can use something called COIL, which will actually spin up a uh, Coil clusters for you, like any in any region of Amazon or other clouds, um, and you can just then use it in your notebook, which is pretty darn cool. Um, because we already have this ability to create a cluster here in this Kubernetes environment on Amazon, we're going to use this one. So we're just going to go and um, execute this cell, and this cell uh, this cell says uh, start up this Dask gateway cluster. Okay, this comes for free when you install this like. This environment using Nabari, and I'll, I'll mention that later. But Nabari is an open source package to deploy this whole infrastructure that you're looking at on any cloud, uh, and it's with a small configuration file. And you know, then you can add users very easily, um, and you can you know you can you can run a complicated cluster like this with all this stuff going on without being like a DevOps person. That's like the main goal of this Nabari deployment was to be make it possible for organizations with a little bit of tech skills to be able to deploy this infrastructure on their own. Now, this, this um, you know, as you notice, this is taking uh, a few minutes because unlike when we logged in, there is already uh, an instance running that could support that uh, worker or the, me, the user, logging in. Um, but in this case, it's spinning up new instances on Amazon to support this cluster that we're asking for. So it took about a minute to actually spin up these four workers. So you notice down here though, I said, uh, well, actually let's just go through this. I said, create this gateway cluster. Okay, on this cluster, I want to specify what environment I want it to, to use. I want it to use the same Python environment that I'm using in my notebook. Um, and so, and then what kind of worker type I can select from different workers. Um, I create this cluster. I get back a client and I tell the cluster, I have a minimum of four workers and a maximum of 30. I, you know, it's sort of arbitrary, but um, we don't really need more than 30 to do this demo. It would be over too quick if I, if I did. So I, I chose these kind of um, for the demo. Uh, I can open up this little, uh, if I click hard enough, I can open up <laughs> this little uh, thing over here um, and I can take this dashboard and put it up there. All right. No, no, geez. Hold on, put your honor control. The assistance? No. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Now, <laughs> and then, yes. <laughs> See. Uh, okay. So I, I, I basically I just put my little uh, dashboard URL. Let's keep doing that because I uh, just need to click somewhere, right? Um, so I've got these um, all these things I can look at. What's going on with my cluster? I really like this cluster map guy. That's cool. Um, and I like uh, this task stream. And I like uh, let's see what do we got? Me about progress. Um, and then I'm going to take this guy. So I'm just showing you some of the functionality here. Um, we can take this cluster map guy and stick it over here. And we can take let's close this thing now over here. Uh, bear with me just whoa, bear with me one second here. Okay, we got this uh, task graph. Progress bar. Let's see progress. Okay, let's put that down here, and let's put this task screen over here. All right, all right. I want. I'm doing this because I want to show you. Um, you know what happens when you run something on a cluster that's wrong notebook. Okay, so now <laughs> back where I want to be. I've got my cluster, yay. And I'm about to basically do the selection of the whole data set. Okay, so when I do shift enter here, I'm starting now to look and you know I'm, I'm selecting this one particular point. Um, and as you recall, it's got a load like 700 chunks of data. Okay, so what's happening is each worker. Is getting is actually doing a separate request to a place in object storage, pulling that data and giving it back to this, you know, to the user here. Now the user doesn't need to open up all these windows; they don't need to know what's going on here. But it's kind of cool to see what is going on, and you know, you might just say, "Hey, my workflow is a lot faster." That's awesome. But um, you know, these kind of things can be sort of nice and trying to diagnose also, like you know, where the pain points are, like in your whole parallel processing system. So. The task stream is going by here. Um, you can see that, like the progress being made toward the end goal here. Um, and you know, you're saying like, you know, like, okay, you have four workers. You can see things are going kind of slowly now. Remember, we had adapt on, and so it's, at some point here, it's going to say, uh, I think we need some more workers. Uh, and so it's going to fire up those workers. And the fact that it, the request probably already went in for more, for more workers. And so it's like spinning up those instances to support the new number of workers here they come. So, and now the, uh, all these workers are, you know, doing their, uh, and we call this the PPU diagram up there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but they, so all the workers are doing, the colors mean what kind of work they're doing. They're communicating to the scheduler, which is sending the information back and, Okay, so with all those processors, you can see how much more you know, quickly we got to the, to the end point, right? And, um, and it spins back down automatically. And whoopsie, wrong, wrong one, sorry. I skewed the wrong cell. But we, now we've got the whole entire um, you know, time series for the entire like 2010 to the present. You know, we can still we can zoom in here and so on. I'm not going to do that right now. Um, and then we can do, you know, if we, if we go ahead and like commute, we can like take. The mean over a whole bunch of you know the, the weight height data. So we like we'll do a whole year. Now that we've got this cluster spot, let's use it again to compute the mean weight height over the entire year. Okay, from hourly data, right? So um, now it's gonna it'll go blazing through because we already have all this workers spun up. And if there were more than one person on this cluster, like if you were using this for your organization, if people were using this for their work, there would always be a bunch of machines spun up and spinning up and spinning down. And, like when you jumped on here, you'd be able to, you know, do this, uh, you know, you wouldn't have to wait for stuff to be spun up a lot of the time. So now we're going to take a look at this mean plot that we just created. So we did this mean over a year. And I shut these off just to have a little bit more so we can see the plot a little better. Um, you know, this is kind of cool. We have uh, the mean weight height over an entire year. And actually, there's a little bit of science in here, believe it or not. You can uh, you can see that down here. And I'm going to turn off that little hover tool. The Gulf Stream uh, is actually causing like increased wave heights and in the vicinity of the wave. There's a couple model, and uh, the waves are actually uh, steepening uh, because the wind is opposing the, the currents in the Gulf Stream. So, uh, yeah, that's the demo. Uh, 
Are we, are we doing on time here? 30 minutes. Yeah. We're at 30 minutes? Yeah. yeah. Good. All right. So, a question before we come back. Yeah. For the, the exo uh, that you showed us with the select. Yeah. Um, I'm, that doesn't completely obviate the pancake problem, right? You still no, no, not at all. No, that has nothing to do with the pancake problem, exactly. Yeah. Exo was mm -hmm. just locating the point at which to describe the data. Okay, so passing is that with the KD tree that you said, is that right? The KD tree is, yeah, it's just because we have a curved linear grid. And so we can't just, if you had a rectilinear grid with X ray, you could just say this Latin is long. But because we have this curvilinear mesh, you can't just say this Latin is long. So you have to say Latin long, and it'll figure out the key tree will figure out yeah what IJ location to select from. Good question. Okay. So um, all right. So oh, these are just back up in case the demo built it. No. <laughs> All right, so, um, so you know, this is just to point out again that we call this Pangeo. Um, you know, we, we, you know, using like these tools like Dask and X-ray and Holdviz and Running and Jupyter, but this is part of the Python ecosystem, right? Like, this can interface with all this, all these other tools, and you know, people are like, hey, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm doing some like stuff with Dask and Pandas and PyTorch. Is that using Pangeo? I'm like, uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, there, is no, there is no real Pangeo, right? It's just a, it's just some collection of factors that this community likes to use, but like tons of other people are using like pandas, and yeah, data frame, and TensorFlow, PyTorch. You know, this is a really sweet ecosystem to work on. I like to say it's future proof. There's like nothing it can't do, and it's also future proof because if you're in this community using a set of tools, the community's going to go somewhere. They might not be using these tools in the future, but they're going to be using some other tools. And if you're part of that community, you just move with them. So, uh, so I just wanted to point out too: this is not just academics or people cutting around, you know, um, running their little notebooks. This whole that whole ecosystem is in production um, at Microsoft. They're run, they're using that exact infrastructure to run the, this uh, planetary computer. So if you go to planetary computer and uh, I think it's still in beta. Like you have to sign up, or I don't know if it's beta, but you have to sign up and get approved. But once you get an account, if you log in, it would look just like what we just did. Um, it's just a regular Jupyter notebook. Uh, it's a Jupyter Hub that scales up on Kubernetes, and that's what Microsoft decided to do, and they're investing back in the community. Um, and actually, I just wanted to say also that I planetary computer is more than just a deployment of Pangeo. I, I think it's like a model of how. Uh, if you're a data provider, like how you or a community that wants to distribute a bunch of different data sets to the community, it's a really good model of how to do it. Um, they have a data catalog that you can go and look at. It looks nice, um, like Landsat and Notice, and you know they've got tons of weather data and all sorts of stuff on here. But the cool thing is, whoops, I thought I had one more. Ah, wait, no, I have one. Oh, okay, shoot. Um, if you go to one of these, if you click on one of these, like Landsat, every single one of these, um, this, this is the cool part. <laughs> and then every one of these data sets, if you click on it, there'll be a notebook that you can run. And the first line of that notebook is going to be a query to a stack catalog every single time. And so there's, a, if you're wondering, how do you find these data sets? Like you just access this random data set, but how would you actually find this? Um, this community is involved with creating. Stack catalogs and stack 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 APIs that will let you find these data sets, uh, and that's an, a great example of that is Microsoft's uh, data catalog with their stack API. So um, people ask like, how do I represent? I thought stack is for remote sensing data. How do I use it with model output? Like from a weather model, I say go look at planetary computer. It's all about the what they're doing. Okay. Um, I just want to mention that before I left USGS, I was the head of the, uh, the architectural lead or something uh, for this big high test project, which is trying to basically take the whole hydrologic modeling workflow from high performance computing on the cloud all the way through cloud optimized data to distribution of analysis and visualization of the type I just showed you through machine learning. Um, so you can go find, you can go if you're interested in something like that, you can go look at high tests. Um, but I wanted to use just this, this one slide from, or two slides from high test 
that we used in our presentations about it just to show, um, you know, if you want your data to be out there in the open data, you know, in this world, you really need it to be on a high speed internet. So, got these circles here. You all of USGS is on this one gig um, network, like uh, every single location except for one, which is the Aeros Data Center in Sioux Falls, and it's at 10. And nowhere else in the USGS is there 100. Uh, but there are lots of there's lots of people who are at 100. <laughs> uh, all the you know all the Internet two, um, uh, DOE, uh, all the major cloud providers, uh, and so this is the world where you want your data to live, um, and it's the world where you want to run your compute. So you can if you have your data here. Um, and you have your compute there, then you can you can leave your data in one place in many cases and be happy. Anybody can access it from any of the computer. So this is what we actually did. I don't, I don't know, I was thought this might be of interest to some of you. Um, we had a petabyte of data, right, that we wanted to distribute to the public. We were a government. How are we going to pay for uh, you know this data if the open data set program say it doesn't want to host it for free, which they did. <laughs> So we had this, we had this, uh, well, actually they eventually did, but uh, we still had to publish it. That's right, not getting my story straight up. To be able to release our data, this is a, a petabyte hydrologic, a uh, warp simulation, 40 years on a four kilometer grid of the US. That is one petabyte output. So um, how we, we, in the government, we had to publish it in a trusted uh, government uh, repository, a trusted digital repository from the US government, a US government computer, before we could let like Amazon have it in an open data set program. So our solution was we put it on tape. Oops, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> we put it on tape and we had a blow, we had a globus endpoint so people could actually get to the data through a URL if they wanted to and pull the data from tape, the original NetCDF box. <laughs> so that's what we call like tough love because like we don't want people to get that data there because that, you know it's there and that's the trusted that's the official repository but from there we actually reach out the data okay that's what this little middle box shows and they're trying to get the right box is done so you know the pancake model is the way it was the data was laid out and we transform it into something that actually makes more sense for people who want to extract time series because it's a little big data set it's got a lot of time steps. So then, and then <clears throat> the open data dataset program or planetary computer will take it. Excellent. Uh, but we want to put it somewhere where we have no egress fees. So if we put it somewhere where there's no egress fees, that means nobody's paying to get the data and nobody's paying when they get your data. So uh, that's a key part of open science. And if they won't take it, we put it on the open storage network, which is an NASA funded project that will allow you to buy a petabyte of storage for about 100K. And it's guaranteed for five years, and you may park it at a, at a super clear size no more. Um, and just a little, just a little comparison. <clears throat> uh, how much things cost to store in the cloud? This is the cost of storing a petabyte for a year. Just the cost, no egress fees. Although these guys all do charge egress fees, um, unless you're part of like some special deal. All these guys, Amazon, Google, and Azure, they all charge about the same, about you know somewhere between 200 and 250 k per year to store a petabyte. Plus all the egress fees again, unless you're part of the like NOAA, the NOAA program or something. So uh, on the other hand, there are commercial companies coming along like Cloudflare R2 and Wasabi who charge no egress fees, and the cost is a lot lower just to even store the data. And then there's the open storage network, which again is like hardware that somebody owns, but it's managed and not you don't have basically you don't have to deal with it. You pay for it, and you know they install it at a data center somewhere, and they maintain it. And um, so, at least for five years, you've got um, a really good deal on your storage with no egress fees. That's what we did. We bought two low and pods, not the government, because the government wouldn't allow us to do that. But because we gave it to an academic organization through our co-op, and they bought it, and they put our data on it, and that was just fine because we had already published it to the government in the official good government way. Uh, okay, so a little bit about, let me ask for a little bit about formats and chunking and stuff. Um, so Zara format was originally designed as, um, uh, part of it actually came out of this 
uh, Pangeo project, we, we realized that NetCDF files by themselves sitting on object storage is used with the NetCDF library. It was very unperformant. Unfortunately, that's the way most of the data is. It's piles of NetCDF files sitting out there. Um, and so, or grid files. And in the beginning, we thought we had to convert uh, the data into another format, which was quite, uh, uh, was quite a, a big lift for a lot of organizations. Um, and so, you know, some people did it and, uh, you know, converting NetCDF into ZAR. Um, the thing about the reason ZAR it works better than NetCDF is because in ZAR, it's pretty much the same data model that you take each chunk of compressed data and you put it in a separate file or you put it in a separate object on object storage. So because those compressed chunks have different sizes, because the compression works differently on each chunk, uh, that's why when they're in a file, you, you, you have to do some work to figure out where those things are and then pull them back and all those little transactions on the cloud ends up being slow because this, the cloud in object storage, there has there's more latency uh, on those reads than a, a file system. So um, great, we have this new format, we, also, we start converting our data into this format um, and, and then we realize, um, well, actually just to say a little bit more about the format, uh, this is actually important later too. Uh, all those chunks of data, the binary chunks of data, um, just go into single files. Just the chunks of data, though, all the metadata about them, like uh, here, like all the things we traditionally think of as metadata, like long name and units and stuff like that, they go into these little files that are text files, so JSON files. So the binary data all sits in these chunks, um, and the metadata is all in these little separate files that are, you know, you can still come to the text edit. Um, I'm going to skip that. And, uh, and so, um, but at some point, we realized, um, well, uh, that's a great model, reading all the metadata at once, and then going poking into these files, just extracting the data. But why couldn't we just poke into the NetCDF files and extract the data? If we knew where the data was, these chunks were. So there was a little package created called Kerchunk, which goes into that CDF file, finds out where all the, the byte ranges of all the chunks, and pulls that out and puts it in metadata. So now we have a sidecar file that contains the metadata for ZAR, but also all the byte ranges. And now then instead of writing ZAR format files, you can use your original in CDF files, but with the ZAR library, reading in parallel, doing byte range reads in parallel, from multiple NetCDF files or the same NetCDF file. If it's on object storage, object storage is really great in terms of being able to support lots of concurrent reads. So you can do lots of binary range requests at the same time. It turns out you don't need this R format to have cloud performant data in the NetCDF model. You can just use the NetCDF files. So um, this is just a little figure that. Kind of, uh, is a, actually, if you want to know, know more about this, that all went really fast, I'm sure. Um, but there's a really nice little thing on cloudnativegeo.org that talks about how to optimize data for multidimensional array data, like we have in the lower left that I've been talking about, <clears throat> but also for other types of data like vector data and point data. So this is the land we were just talking about where you have these HDF, RIB, NetCF, whatever, geotiffs, and you create these references. Uh, and then you can use this, this uh, you know, basically this Kirchhoff approach. And that's what <clears throat> that's what you saw happening in the data set that we that we accessed. So, um, uh, so you know, I'm not going to go through all this. There's lots of benefits. <laughs> Let's get. I want to get to the questions. Um, but so delivering uh, delivering Pangeo, like, okay, great, Rich. How do you deploy this stuff? Like, how do we actually do what you just did? So one way is that you can hire a company like 2ICC was set up specifically to help organizations just, you pay them a little bit, they give you access to the thing I just showed you basically. Um, Coil, we mentioned, you, you can just sign up with a credit card or whatever, and you know, and they charge you by how much gas use you actually use. So it's not like a certain amount per year or anything, you just pay as you go, it actually just burn some more of your Amazon credits or whatever, or your you know real dollars. <laughs> Um, and then Navari is the third one that I like to advocate um, that, I, that I've used a bunch. I use it in my, my, my training. We use it with the ESET deployment. We're using it at, um, at USGS. 
Um, it's, it's a pretty sweet um, thing where it's just you fly on a cloud, there's no extra fees, there's nobody you're paying, um, and you're not paying a surcharge on any of your computing. Um, and then look, if you want to learn more about this, Project Pythia is a great place to go. It's the training arm of, of Pangeo. Um, there's lots of like anything from just basic Python learning to up through X-ray, Dask, all those tools. Um, and I just want to mention this too, because they're having a little cook-off uh, in, in June in Boulder, uh, if anybody wants to go. Uh, and I asked them specifically, like, hey, it's, can anybody just go? Like, me and who just don't really you just want to learn more about this? And I said, absolutely. So be a great place to meet people who are building real notebooks to solve, like, real science problems. And just, you know, just a lot of fun. Because it's, it's in Boulder. So, uh, yeah, okay. I'm going to skip over that, all this stuff, too. You can read that later. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Uh, yeah, any, any questions? Thanks, Rich. Yeah. Uh, 15 minutes for questions. Anyone want to join for lunch after this? Feel free. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, I have a lot of questions. <laughs> yes. Which is, we've been dealing with uh, the large file problem, or well, the many file problems with JSON for chunk files for a long time. Uh, you had a brief look at the slide that seemed to suggest that you can substitute arcades. Oh my God, that. yes. You yes. On that yes. So, um, yeah. So, the great thing about having text files like JSON is um, you know, there are text files that you can read uh, and edit. You know, you can change the metadata. But when you get these big, big data sets, uh, you create these JSON little things for each file. The pattern is, yeah, you create these little JSON references for each file, and then you combine them together. And we used to be Used to be, we combine them into a giant JSON, which could be like yeah, six gigabytes. And then you'd need maybe 200 gigabytes of RAM to load the thing, decode it, and figure out where the references are. When all you really want to do is load like temperature at a particular time step. That makes no sense, right? So, um, this, this is actually a contribution. I think the guy was at the Small Ice Center. So, I wanted to just throw the references in like multiple parquet files instead of an attack giant JSON. And then when you open up the data set, you only have to open up, you don't even have to open any references. And when you go to get a variable, like maybe you get uh, you know, from from uh, you get something from the temperature variable from uh, you know 1900 or from you know 1990 or something, the 1990 to year two, you know, 2000 could be in its own little parquet file, and then and you just dip in and you read the references that you need. To then be able to go into the NetCDF files and pull out the byte ranges. And it's way faster uh, because you're just like, you turn now, not only is the data lazy loading, but now the references are lazy loaded. Like, you only need the references when you want to get the data, right? Like, you don't need all the other references for the data you're not going to get. So, that really was a game changer. And then, just recently, um, like within the last few weeks, Martin um, Durant, who's like principal developer, has added the ability to append on the part data files as well. So you have a forecast model and it's pumping out new stuff every day, or you have a new satellite pass. It used to be you had to combine all the data again from all those individual files. Now you can just append the latest stuff onto your existing parquet file collection, and life is beautiful. Other questions? Just a little bit of comment. Yeah, Jerry. Oh, uh, yeah, I have a comment and a question. My comment is for everyone in the room. Same project, Pythia. That is, that is your friend. Because I've done Python for about know, 12 years now, and every time I've run into crazy problems like cardio pie projections or pandas uh, subsetting, Project Pythia has no books that do that. Like, I wish that existed five years ago. Yeah. You know, I would bang my head against the wall a million times over something silly, but it's in there. And I highly suggest everybody, whether or not if you're in the course, to do it. I guess my standard. My question. Okay. So, Pangeo, Project Pythia, all these notebooks, they do a great job. They ask, they do a great job at one thing, make one map, make a time series. Mm -hmm. I need to do it 100,000. What is a good Pangeo, a Pangeo solution to do lots of things in parallel? So, um, yeah, that's a great point. So, yeah, I've been showing you this interactive stuff and, yeah, notebooks and, uh, you know, yeah, eventually you want to actually just crank some stuff through, <laughs> but still use your cluster, 
right? So um, there's lots of different ways like to run workflows, um, but uh, like if you use Nibari, it's got Argo workflows built in. So Argo is like a you know a workflow tool for Kubernetes, and um, you know there's a learning curve, but um, that's where you can operationalize, you know, just like batch a bunch of stuff or whatever, or have a more complicated workflow set up. Um, and it'll still be using your cluster, you'll be able to use like the same environments. There's but there's lots, like you know, some people use prefect and some people use you know, all sorts of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beam, yeah, all sorts of stuff. Yeah, yeah, there's like I don't think. I don't think it's really sorted out yet in the community. Like for geoscience, like this is the one that you know you really there's just like there's a lot, and um, it's not quite as it hasn't done gone through the sorting process. I don't think as much as you know this got the like, bonus that I showed you here. But for sure, you can you can do it, and you can use the same tools, you can use the same environment, you can use the same, use the same infrastructure. There's one question on the chat, uh, which is asking for the notebooks using the demo. I guess I can't send the link to the data. Yeah, yeah, it's just C O A W S T coast coupled ocean atmosphere wave and sediment transport model. It's a little bit of a mouthful. C O A W S T. The good thing about it is you're not going to get some weird random hit on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> so if you just search that in open data, you'll land on the page, the notebook will be there. Um, yeah, you can try out Coil. Coil, you can try out for free. They give you a bunch of like uh, free credits. So you can go play around with a toy, spinning up a Coil cluster using that notebook. Just have to sign up for Coil, it's free. Um, you know, and then uh, eventually if you run out of your monthly credits, you know, they would eventually charge you. Um, but I don't even think you have to put your credit card in again. I'm not sure. I don't think so. Yeah. So, um, one quick comment on that. Yeah. Your timing is perfect. Um, many people in the room are in a course where we're teaching some of these these things. And this morning we just talked about performant formats and I on cloud after storage, push on filtering, lazy loading, zero copy pipelines. You perfectly demonstrated all of those. Nice. So perfect timing. Thank you. Oh, wow, that's great. I'm glad you're teaching a class. Thank if, you. <laughs> if you all want to run these notebooks, and I highly encourage you to do so, the mo last module we logged into the Jupyter Lab cluster. That is the exact same platform that he was just demonstrating, set up slightly differently, but on our accounts, and you have credits. So you can run them on that desk cluster there and use the exact code that he just showed us to run these in the exact same way. Um, and everything is pretty configured for you. If, if you want to do that and run into problems with that question, it's a good job. That'd be cool. Yeah, you should do that. Let, let me know. It should work. <laughs> Scott. Yes. So this is. Uh... Well, it's a selfishly motivated question, but I'm not the only one that's run into this issue. You have a global time series of satellite data, and you want to generate an index value for a point on the globe. Looking at that entire time series, you have a SAR yeah. uh, data store, you chunk it, you pull in a chunk, you process that chunk, you want to write it back out to long, but it's a lot long time scale data set going back out. I've been completely unsuccessful at appending to czar along more than one dimension. Would you recommend, what would you recommend for an output data set or something like that when you're pulling in, say, a satellite time series yeah. and you want to write out an index, a precipitation index? You mean, is, it a, is it like a time series that you're writing out? Yes, it's a time series index for precipitation yeah. over various different time scales 30 yeah. days, 90 days, 180, up to two years. Yeah. And it gets written out in the same format. It's almost the same size as the input data set. Um, it's the present values of its sum over the time series. Oh, um, I bet I guess I bet I guess what the problem is. So, I, I, so in this current version of Czar, uh, Every chunk needs to be the same size, and except for the last chunk. So if you write, you write some time series out, and you got like a partial chunk on the end, and then you try to append to it, it's gonna fail because you got now you got like a non-uniform chunk in there. But for time series, I think sometimes you just like write the whole thing off. <laughs> well, yes. in, in one case, I think. Do that, but you yeah. know, the way this processing works, there's so much data that I clean it out and then chunk it by latitude. Chunk. Yeah. So yeah. in my own head, what I want to be able to do is append by latitude and longitude. I want to take this chunk 
this all times, all times, here for this spot on the globe, this box. Oh, okay, so you've got a bunch of lat one points, or yeah. and you have them all in the same data set? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I think this current proposal is all right to consider adjusting that part of that is still under review. Process. Yeah, definitely. But there's, I mean, we, we should talk later. There's actually a bunch of ways like to solve that problem, I think. Yeah. You, you briefly mentioned that you reach on the data set. Yes. Could you talk about that experience? Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, so I didn't mention reach hunting. So I mentioned curve chunk, which is great if your original chunks are like somewhat reasonable. Uh, but you know, if you want to do this time series extraction, uh, pretty much all our data sets, as I mentioned, are like written like pancakes, whether it's remote sensing or whether it's you know my lab, which may be a thicker pancake. <laughs> you know, you get these pancakes, and so you really then have to rechunk. And rechunking is a uh, an operation that is um, challenging to task. It doesn't sound that hard, and um, like, but some of these tools that try to make it easy for you to do parallel processing on the back end, they have to figure out what operations to do, right? To do whatever you wanted it to do. And when you tell it to do rechunking, uh, it doesn't make very good decisions. So it's not very efficient. So there's a whole separate package written called rechunker. There's some other approaches. Probably don't really want to get into the whole thing, but basically, um, yeah, rechunker is a package that lets you, uh, it, it writes an intermediate file. It basically splits like your pancakes do a bunch of like uh, a small stack of pancakes with a bunch of like little columns, and then and then in the second step you write all that out, and then the next step just adds up all those little columns so that you you have the full rechunk thing. So like you turn your pancakes right into these little like bricks, or literally like the shape of bricks, and they are longer bricks or whatever, but standing 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 up or something. Um, that with a petabyte still was challenging, and what we ended up doing was um, actually doing, we had, we were used a supercomputer, <laughs> because that's where the data was, that made sense. And so we had, uh, we took each two week chunk, so all the hourly data that fits into two weeks, and we gave that to the rechunker package. That was one of our jobs. So at the end of that, we got two weeks of rechunk data out. At the same time, because we were on a supercomputer, we submitted to a bunch of other a bunch of other nodes, which each had 32 four, 36 cores. And so we used job uh, Swarm's job array to submit all of those at the same time. So each node was working individually with a local NAS cluster, converting their two weeks of data. And at the end, uh, you know, four hours later, we had reached our goal. More minutes. Before we close this whole thing down and everyone can have your lunch. If not, I think I just want to make one more comment about Rich said is about the community and also the open parliament. Like a lot of things that you heard Richard talking about, a lot of those really happened in the past two to three years. The things that Richard was talking about, the part of uh, Parquet as a reference file has only happened right. in the last year, um, past few months. A lot of times is that people find the issue. And they want to contribute back to the community, so not just there for their own data or for their own organization. So that is something really powerful. It's really crowdsourcing all those solutions that, um, like the ZAR, uh, the X-ray, and other things. So the active developments and the functions can be added later on, you know, like the, the new proposal for the ZAR format to be more flexible to solve some solution, uh, some some problems listing. That's a great that's a great point. I mean, you scratch your own itch, you fix it, and then not only did you fix your own problem, you just fixed it for the whole community. It really feels good. Right. Yeah, to be, I've been mean, giving out and receiving side of that. <laughs> if you yeah. can get through that part of the process. Yeah. yeah. Right. With that, we want to thank Rich again and thanks everyone for joining either online or in person here today. We had 40 people online today. Nice. Mm -hmm.